Jack the Hart was born on 19th of April 1932 in Battersea, South London, one of five children along with brothers Henry, Leonard and Fred and his sister Jean. During World War II, the family split up and he lived with an aunt in Gilby Road, Tooting. His first criminal conviction was in October 1946, when he was taken to Buntingford Juvenile Court for stealing a watch and cigarettes. When McVitie was 14, he met Esther Marnie, who was a year younger than him. She attended the Western Road Secondary Modern School for Girls in Mitcham. McVitie and Mary were engaged by 1949, and Mary fell pregnant soon after. His daughter, Mary Elizabeth, was born in St. James's Hospital in Balham on the 6th of September 1950. He was partaking in his national service and soon married Marie, married at Wandsworth Registry Office. The small family moved to a property in Forest Road, East London, age 18 at the time. Marie rarely got to see McVitie when he was on army detention in Reading and the couple separated shortly after. McVitie's criminal life began properly in March 1952. He was put into the Borsal system after stealing and also around four months later received one month imprisonment and further time in Borsal for assaulting a police officer. In 1954, McVetti met Sylvia Ann Mitchell, who became his common-law wife, and he had his second child with her, Tony Jackson McVitie, in 1958. McVitie was soon sentenced to seven years imprisonment on 3rd of April 1959, after being found guilty with three other men of being in possession of explosives for possessing a flick knife in public. Soon the couple separated. Jack was five feet nine inches tall, heavily built, with blue eyes and on his hands, arms and chest, numerous tattoos, one being Anne, on his left wrist. Many people spoke well of him, despite the reputation he had been of a violent drunkard. The nickname Jack the Hat is said to be because of a trilby hat that he once wore to cover up his hair loss. Allegedly, not even taking it off in the bath. It was alleged that at some point he pushed a girlfriend out of a moving car whilst he was driving it, to which she suffered terrible injuries. At one time, he was described as a lovely man by Frankie Fraser, who had spent some time with him in prison. It was while they were in Exeter to prison in 1959 that Frank and Jimmy Andrews, who Cornell was visiting in hospital on the day of his murder, stuck up for Jack the Hat after he had a straight go with the prison warden. Jack beat the officer fair and square, smashed him to smithereens, but there was no straight fight for the prison authorities and Jack was later dragged from his cell and badly beaten up. Frank and Jimmy had said that if Jack was touched in any way, that they would retaliate. The next day, Frank knocked out the prison governor and Jimmy knocked out the chief, chief prison officer. Frank and Jimmy ended up in hospital badly injured. Jack the Hat received 12 strokes of the birch for his attack on the officer. Jimmy Andrews got 15 and Frankie Fraser got the maximum 18 strokes for their assaults on the governor and the chief. A known drug trafficker by the 1960s, Jack had been an associate of the Cray Twins for some time, and although never a permanent member of the firm, was regularly employed to commit various crimes on their behalf. On 5th of November 1965, Jack McVitie had been released from prison after serving his sentence for possessing explosives and carrying an offensive weapon. Apart from the occasional minor motoring offence, he had managed to keep himself out of trouble and had begun working as a bookmaster's clerk. He had also begun living with Sylvia Barnard, with whom he had his third child. Since meeting Reggie in prison, Jack had always wanted to work for the firm. Although dependent on drugs and as well as developing a serious drinking habit, Jack Dixon was given the job of tailing McVitie to make sure he did his jobs for the twins properly. But on the way back from the pickup, McVitie must have realised he was being followed and drove so fast that Dixon lost him in traffic. By 1967, living at 42 Hartland Road in Stratford, McVitie was a loudmouth drunk. He was not only dealing in drugs, but taking them as well. He was getting arrogant and abusive, threatening the twins and causing trouble to many of their friends. He caused some damage in Freddie Foreman's club in Balham High Road, and he had to be thrown out, much to the twins' embarrassment. He also tried to shoot Tommy Flanagan in the Regency, and once after cutting a man in the basement of the club, he went upstairs and wiped the bloody knife in a woman's dress. One evening he had been stopped from entering the Regency for being too drunk. He came back later and threatened to shoot John Barry and his brother, the owners of the club of a shotty. They were paying protection to their silent partners, Ronnie and Reggie Cray, and asked him if he would sort it out. The twins were now getting complaints about McVitie on frequent occasions. 
They had warned him on numerous occasions he would not listen. He also owned Ronnie and Reggie a large sum of money and wasn't one of the firm, but he did work for the twins occasionally and it had been said that the money he owed the craze was for the contract killing of their business partner, Leslie Payne, which he never carried out. In 1967, Ronnie Cray paid me £5,500 in advance to kill an ex-friend and business partner, Leslie Payne, promising he would give another 500 when the job was finished. I made fears that Payne was about to inform the police of his criminal activities. McVitie and a friend, Billy Exley, set off to shoot Payne, but were unsuccessful. Exley, the driver, suffered from heart trouble, and McVitie was now heavily dependent on drugs. Exley started to lose his nerve when McVitie produced a handgun, in Exley words, the size of a bleeding cannon. Arriving at Payne's home, McVitie hammered loudly on the front door, which luckily for Payne was opened by his wife. He's not in, she said. That's all right, said McVitie, and he had actually left. Instead of repaying the money, McVitie kept it. This incident led in part to McVitie's death. On 29th of October 1967, McVitie was invited to a party at 97 Evering Road in Stoke Newington with several of his underworld associates and their families. The craze had secretly arrived at the party first and had spent an hour clearing away guests. Reggie Cray's initial plan to shoot McVitie upon entry failed. His gun jammed and instead he stabbed McVitie repeatedly in the face, chest and stomach as part of a brief but violent struggle. The twins quickly fled the scene and McVitie's body was deposited, wrapped in an elder down and left outside St Mary's Church, Rotherhive, by Tony and Chris Lambriano and Ronnie Bender, who were minor members of the firm. When the Crays discovered the whereabouts of the corpse, they ordered for it to be immediately moved, probably because of the close proximity of friends and associate Freddie Foreman. The body has never been recovered, although in an interview in 2000, which featured Reg Cray, giving a frank account of his activity of the firm 12 days before his death, Foreman admitted to throwing McVitie's body from a boat into the sea at New Haven, Sussex. He was also reported to have been buried in a newly dug grave at Gravesend Cemetery in Kent. Okay, guys, so I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I thought there's some quite good photos uh, of Jack the Hat and a bit more information, especially him bashing up the uh, the warden. I found a news article on that one. Uh, and that the fact that people like Mad Frankie Fraser, although in some quarters he gets sort of mugged off a little bit, he was a dead serious person, Mad Frank Fraser, from what I can gather from all the reports and from what people say. I'm very staunch in prison. And Jack the Hat sometimes portrayed as just being a loser, etc. But he was a serious guy in his own right. Apparently, he fought valiantly uh, when they, they murdered him in the end, the Cray brothers, um, and did have a lot of respect off a lot of people. So I thought that was a, a good little documentary to bring you. If you liked it, please let me know in the comments who you would like me to do next. Smash the likes out there and share it and hit the notification as well.